about the existence of Fourier series and some more, perhaps a little more uncomfortable. We cannot differ uncomfortable things for long and therefore we would like to consider them. The point at which we left yesterday was, we said if x of t is periodic, <coughs> and let the fundamental period be x of fundamental period be t0, and then if we wish to approximate x of t by a series, not quite Fourier series, but by a series which is finite, that is, we wish to approximate x of t by a finite series of the form of Fourier, that is, a k, a to the power j k omega 0 t, omega 0 is of course 2 pi over t 0, <coughs> And it is a finite series, that is k equal to minus n to plus n. That is why the subscript n has been put here, x subscript n of t. Forget about Fourier series. What we used to do is, given a periodic function, we wish to approximate it by a finite series of the form of Fourier. That is, we take the fundamental frequency, we take its second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on and so forth, up to the nth harmonic. What kind of an approximation is this? This is the question that we are asking. Now, in order to answer this question, first what we do is, we define an error function, E n of t. And the error is defined as x of t minus x n of t. That is the difference between the two, which can be positive, or negative, and therefore what we do is, we take the magnitude squared of the error function and integrate for all values of time, minus infinity to plus infinity. And we call this capital E sub n. That is, the capital E subscript capital N is the integrated error in approximating the given periodic function x of t by a finite series of the form of Fourier. Mind you, a case have not yet been determined. What we wish to do is, under what conditions, under what values of a k, shall this error be minimum? And therefore, we set for ourselves the task of minimizing E n. Minimize E n by choosing a case properly, by choosing the coefficients a k. Alright? Do you understand the problem? The problem is, given a periodic function, can we approximate it by a finite series of the form of Fourier series? Fourier series is infinite. So we take a finite series and we ask the question, what values of a k should we choose in order that this error we set ourselves the criterion of error as the squared integrated error, all right? For what values of a k is this e n a minimum? Now, before we do that, I wish to introduce a term called energy in the context of signals and systems. And this term is defined like this. Any signal x of t, if you take the mod squared, we are taking mod because the signal could be positive or negative if it is real, or the signal if it is complex, then we take simply the mod. Any signal, mod squared, integrated over all values of time, dt, is called the energy of the signal. It is called the energy of x of t. Now, you notice that our error function, E n, is simply equal to mod e n t squared d t, it is the integrated squared error, magnitude squared error, and I can call this in terms of this definition as the energy of the error signal, energy of the error signal, that is error is defined as x t minus x n of t. And the task that we have set ourselves for is to minimize E n by choosing, I repeat this, by choosing a case. 
The mathematical development is not very complicated, but lest it uh, diverts us from our main track, I will skip this, and I'll simply say that this minimization problem has been solved, and it is found that En is minimum when Ak is given by the same formula as that of the Fourier series coefficients, namely it is 1 by t0 integral over t0 x of t e to the minus j k omega 0 t dt, the same formula, which is ex an extremely interesting result. It shows that a truncated Fourier series, now uh, <coughs> note this carefully, it shows that a truncated Fourier series is the best approximation to the given periodic function in the least squared error sense. All right, let me write it down. Uh, truncated Fourier series, truncated Fourier series is the best approximation to a given periodic function in the least, why do you say least? Least squared error sense. Alright, why do you say least? Because we set ourselves the problem of minimizing the integrated error. And the integrated error was the squared error, which was integrated for all possible values of time. That's why the word least, the adjective least. So it is a least squared error sense truncated Fourier series is the best approximation. And this uh, is one of the reasons why uh, you remember Lord Kelvin said about Fourier series that it is a piece of mathematical poem. One did not anticipate, Fourier did not anticipate that this would be so. It was proved later that it is indeed the best approximation in the least squared error sense. Now come to those, this is one question. The second question that I ask is, all right, you can expand a given, uh, a given periodic function in Fourier series, a k e to the power j k omega 0 t, k equals minus infinity to plus infinity, and where a k is 1 over t 0 integral over t 0 x of t e to the j k omega 0 t dt. The questions that we are asking is, how do you know that a k, some a k, shall not blow up? One or more a k's may blow up, that is, it may go to infinity. Then the Fourier series, Fourier series obviously does not exist, all right? Then the Fourier series does not exist, if one or more a k's go to infinity. That's one question, and the second question is, even if a k's are finite, how do you know that this summation will converge to x of t? How do you know? That is, we can start with the truncated Fourier series, capital N. That is, we can start with this question can be asked in a slightly different manner like this. That is, we start with summation a k e to the j k omega 0 t, k equals minus n to plus n, all right? And then and then we increase n, that is, we allow n to go to infinity. How do you know that this will converge to x of t? Even if a k's, even if none of the a k's blow up, even if all the a k's are finite, this summation may or may not converge to x of t. These are two irritating and annoying questions that has to be asked about Fourier series and its existence. And the answers to these questions have been in terms of sufficiency only so far. That is, we have found out, people have found out conditions long back, early 1900s or late 1800s. People have found out sufficient conditions for the existence of Fourier series, not necessary and sufficient conditions. And there are two types of conditions that one talks of. One is 
All right, let's write it. Conditions for existence of Fourier series. One set of conditions is in terms of the energy. That is, one says that x of t, if the energy of the signal x of t, the periodic signal, well, what range of t should we integrate? A period, because this is periodic. Did I make a mistake in the earlier one? That is when we found out the total integrated error. We did make a mistake. We said from minus infinity to plus infinity. We don't do that, because that, that has to go to infinity unless em is zero. Isn't that right? So would you please correct that? Shall I take out that slide and make this correction? This is it. En, this is over one period, t0. Okay, would you make this correction? So, we say that the energy of the signal is, is finite. This is one of the one set, one of the conditions for existence of Fourier series. And it can be shown that this is a sufficient condition. What we do is, well, to prove that it is a sufficient condition, what we have to show, follow this carefully, that given this, we have to show that none of the AKs blow up. That is, we have to show that AK is also finite. Given this, show that AK is finite. If you can do that, then you are at least ensured that you can make an expansion. The question of convergence of the given expansion to X of T can then be taken at a later stage. First, let us show this. That is, if the energy of the signal is finite, then the coefficients in the Fourier series are also finite. And the proof uh, is a bit involved, but I'm tempted to do this here because of the uh, of one of the most one of the very important inequalities of mathematics, uh, which it shall evoke. The proof follows like this: a k is given by one by t zero integral over t zero x of t e to the power minus j k omega zero t dt, and a k star its complex conjugate is given by 1 by t0, integral t0, x star of, let's say, tau. We can take any dummy variable, because you are integrating over one period, e to the power minus j, k, not minus, it would be, it would be plus, because we are taking the complex conjugate. So, e to the power j, k, omega 0, tau, d tau. And therefore, a k mod squared, if I multiply the two, it would be simply 1 by t0 squared, 1 by t0 squared, then two integrals. One is x of t e to the minus j k omega 0 t dt, multiplied by the second integral, which is also over one period, x star of tau e to the power j k omega 0 tau d tau. Now, obviously, obviously, this magnitude squared, if I introduce, if I take the mod on the right hand side of the integrand, if I take the mod of this on the right hand side, all right, then this equality sh sign should be replaced by inequality. What kind? Less than or greater than? Less than. Because obviously taking the mod, the integral will be greater. And therefore this would be less than or equal to. Now, what is this mod equal to? Isn't it simply mod x of t? Because the mod of e to the j theta is 1. And similarly, this mod is also x of tau. So that the right hand side simply becomes 1 by t0 squared integral of mod xt dt whole squared. Is that, is that correct? Right? Because I have got two integrals which are identical. t and tau are dummy variables. 
the integral is a definite integral over one period. So it is a, it is a single value. And therefore, the end result of my discussion is that a k mod squared <coughs> ak mod squared is less than equal to 1 by t0 squared integral over t0 mod x of t dt whole squared okay whole squared now i take that inequality one of the finest inequalities in in analysis mathematical analysis is the schwarz christoffel I think I, I'll check the name. No, it is simply Schwarz's inequality. There is a transformation in the name of Schwarz and Christopher. This inequality is Schwarz's inequality. Schwarz's inequality is like this. A very simple one. Uh, it says that integral f of t g of t over any interval a to b the squared of this the squared of this of course dt must be less than or equal to the integral of the individual mods, that is absolute integrals of the individual functions, product of them, multiplied by a to b integral g of t dt. This is Schwarz's inequality. I want to apply this to this particular situation. And for that, let me write this again. Integral f t g t dt mod squared from a to b is less than equal to integral a to b mod f t square d t multiplied by a to b mod g t square d t. This is Schwarz's inequality. Now in order to apply this to the present situation, we take let's say f of t is equal to mod x of t and we take g of t as equal to 1. We also take the inter interval, that is b minus a. Our integration is over one period, so we take this as t0. Then see what happens. On the left hand side, I get integral over t0 mod x of t squared dt. And in the left hand side, in the right hand side, Oh, it's a square of integral. Okay. So we get x t dt integral a to b, well, over t0, square. Is that your uh, question? Well, this is less than equal to. All right? So this becomes less than equal to. Now look at the right hand side. I get integral over t0 mod no I'm stuck <coughs> that's what we need to do that's fine that's the energy ok mod x of t squared dt multiplied by t0 All right, and I think you have got the result. No? If I if I go back to the previous slide, mod a k squared was less than equal to this, and I have proved that this this magnitude squared delete this step. This magnitude squared is t0 less than equal to t0 into absolute integral of x t squared. And therefore, 
if x t squared d t integral t zero is less than infinity, then then from here a k squared shall be less than infinity, which means that a k is finite. Is it proof okay? I am sorry for the uh, confusion here. I didn't want to go to this stage because this stage is already here on the right hand side. So this is less than infinity and therefore a k is less than infinity mod a k which means that a k's are finite. So one question has been solved namely that if the energy of the signal that is t0 x t mod square d t is less than infinity then this leads to the coefficients less than infinity coefficients are bounded. The next question is, all right, coefficients are bounded, but how do you know that this a k uh, e to the power j k omega 0 t k equals minus infinity to infinity, how do you know that this converges to x of t? Let me tell you there is no answer to this. All that it means, all that it means is that the energy in the error function is zero. If you define error e of t as the given periodic function minus now no longer x n but the total series that is k equal to minus infinity to plus infinity a k e to the j k omega zero t. If you define an error like this, all that this means is that the there is no energy, there is no energy in the error function. That is integral over t0 e t squared dt shall tend to 0. All right. That is the only convergence, only sense of convergence that you can apply. Let me repeat. Once you are able to establish that a k is finite, all that you know is that the given function can be expanded in this series. It does not mean that at each value of t, the two sides are identical. It does not mean that at a given value of t, x of t is identical to this function. All that it means is that the difference between the two, magnitude squared of that, integrated over one period, shall get to zero. Is the point clear? So, this existence is in a restricted sense. It does exist, it does exist, but it does not guarantee that at every point of time x of t will be identical to the Fourier series. Alright, so it is in a sense an incomplete, sufficient condition. Sufficient condition, but incomplete, because we are not able to say, we are not able to say that at each value of t, x of t is identical to the summation. In order to solve this problem, in order to solve this problem, Dirichlet, a, a, an American mathematical physicist, uh, I'm sorry, is a German, German mathematician. Peter Gustav, three initials, P, G, I can't pronounce this, those who know German may do it correctly. P, Leon, Peter Gustav, Leon, L-E-J-E-U-N-E, Leon, okay, we'll call him P, G, L, Dirichlet, P, G, L, Dirichlet, Dirichlet, lived for 54 years. That was his lifespan, a German mathematician, but contributed profusely to several disciplines of mathematics, number theory, analysis, mechanics. He was born on February 13th, 1805, educated, although a German mathematician, he was educated in France at Cologne and Paris. He held professorships at two universities, Breslau and Berlin, and in 1855, four years before his death, he succeeded 
Carl Frederick Gauss. You have heard his name? Gauss. One of the greatest intellectuals who was ever born on earth. At the most famous institution of higher learning at that point of time, it was Göttingen. Carl Gauss was professor of mathematics at Göttingen, and after he, after he retired on superannuation, Dirichlet was elected to this position. It was the highest distinction that the country could offer to a mathematician, and he held this post till his death, which was rather premature, <coughs> May 5th, 1859. Dirichlet took up this annoying questions of existence of Fourier series and came up again with a set of sufficient condition. Alas, it was only sufficient. And these go in the literature as Dirichlet conditions. And there are three of them which I shall explain, but not prove. The proof is beyond the scope of this class. There are three conditions, and each of and the three together are sufficient conditions for the existence of Fourier series. The first is the first thing Dirichlet uh, asked is what what about the absolute integrability? Why energy? Why talk of energy? Why don't you take integral over t0 mod of x of t dt? What about this? Should this be finite? Obviously, it should be finite. If the energy is to be finite, if that is a sufficient condition, well, this must be finite. This is the first Dirichlet condition. For example, the first Dirichlet condition is that the that the function itself should be absolutely integrable in one period. In one period, the absolute integral of this must be finite, must be bounded. Look at a function, a violation, or a counterexample of this. That is a function which does not obey this condition. I can have a periodic function like this, t, x of t, and let's say this is 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. It's a periodic function. Let during one period the function behave like this. That is, well, during the next period it behaves like this, and so on. And let's say the law of variation is 1 by t. No, let's take this, the basic period, that is 0 to 1. Well, in every period it's the same, it repeats. There is a discontinuity at integer values of t, t equal to 1. I am just constructing an example. There is a discontinuity, um, and the discontinuity is infinite. That is, 1 by t, so at t equal to 0, it is infinity. Similarly, at t equal to 1, if you approach from the left, the value is 1, 1 by t. If you approach from the right, the value is infinity. So there is discontinuity. Now, obviously, within one period, the integral... What is the integral dt by t? It is log natural of t, and log natural of 0 is minus infinity. Log natural of 1 is 0, but 0 minus minus infinity, and therefore the integral is plus infinity. And therefore this is a function, it is a periodic function. It is x of t equal to x of t plus 1. Isn't that right? x of t equal to x of t plus 1. 1 is the period. But it does not obey the first Dirichlet condition, and therefore the Fourier series does not exist. The second condition, <coughs> condition two says that the function x of t may have a finite number of maxima and minima during one period. X of t must have it can have maxima and minima. For example, a sine function has maxima and minima, but in general, if x of t is periodic, this periodic function must have a finite number of maxima and minima over one period. Well, a, a, a deviation, an example of a function which does not obey this. 
is let's say x of t equal to sine of 2 pi over t. It is periodic. It's a sine function. It has to be periodic. But you see, the number of maxima and minima, t equal to 0, the value is infinity. From infinity to t equal to 1, it is 2 pi. Now, infinity can be infinite number of times twice pi. And therefore, the number of periods, the number of maxima and minima between t equal to 0 and t equal to 1 is infinite. All right, and therefore this does not have a Fourier series. The third condition of the display. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, the previous example which you quoted, x equal to sine of two pi over t, is oh. this periodic, sir? Is this periodic? Yes, it's a sine function, therefore it must be periodic. Okay, is one by t periodic? No. No. How did you make it periodic? We made it repeat. The 1 by t minus floor of t. No, I think you are missing the point. The point is, just a minute. This function x of t is equal to this for 0 less than t less than 1. And whatever the picture is between 0 and 1, we force the same picture between 1 and 2, between 2 and 3, and therefore the function, you are quite right, the function by itself is not periodic. But what I am saying is during one period, the xt behaves like this. And then this picture, I simply shift by 1, by 2, and so on. I repeat on this side as well as that side. In a similar manner, I did the same thing with 1 by t. I said it's between 0 and 1, and then you simply repeat this. Obviously, that is a periodic function. All right? If you so desire, if you so desire, you call this x1 of t, and then write x i t, I construct the periodic function, u t minus u t minus, no, I beg your pardon, x i t, u t minus t i minus u t minus t i minus 1 and sum over all i's. Is that okay? What we are doing is we are multiplying this function by gates. Shift it by 1 second h. It should be t minus oh t i is i. Okay? t i is i an integer, if you say 1, 2 and so on. Okay, all right, I. I'll agree to that. So, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to force it to be periodic. What I have described is only over one period. During one period, the number of maxima and minima is infinite, and therefore it disobeys Dirichlet's second condition, and it cannot be expanded into Fourier series. The third Dirichlet condition is that the number uh, <coughs> no, I have to state it carefully. The third condition is that x of t must have I'm going to use um, confusing words, that's why I'm hesitating, must have, okay, finite number, second condition was in terms of maxima and minima, first condition was in terms of integrability, absolute integrability, nothing to do with energy, it was simply absolute integrability, third condition has to do with discontinuities, is the function allowed to have a discontinuity, you have seen that as a a square pulse, a periodic pulse, does have a Fourier series. We saw, we saw that. And a square pulse has a discontinuity, two discontinuities in one period. Even then it has a Fourier series. So the third condition, third Dirichlet condition, has to do with discontinuities. And the third Dirichlet condition is xt must have finite number of finite discontinuities. I am using the word finite twice. 
discontinuities. Finite number of finite discontinuities. That is, no discontinuity should be infinite. For example, that 1 by t function, it had one infinite discontinuity. That is not permissible. You will see later, you will see later the sufficiency of this condition. In other words, you they are not necessary. What does it mean? It means that you can have functions which disobey 1, 2, 3, still have a full incidence. All right? Sufficiency means that if the function obeys this, then you are guaranteed to have a full incidence. But it is not necessary. That means even if a function disobeys this, there can be a full incidence. For example, if you take, I am tempted to cite this example right here. If you take a chain of delta functions, infinite on this side as well as this side, what is the discontinuity? The magnitude of discontinuity is infinite, but even then it has a full incidence. So this is a counter example to Dirichlet conditions. This is an example to show that Dirichlet conditions are not necessary. They are sufficient. It means that if Dirichlet conditions are satisfied, you are guaranteed to have a full incidence. It is not true in the converse manner. Okay, let me illustrate this point. Xt must have a finite number of finite discontinuities. And a very elegant example of a function Xt which does not obey this is like this. Now look at what I am doing. We have a function which remains at uh, 1 from 0 to 4, all right, from 0 to 4, and then at t equal to 4, this is t, uh, let me use some different color, okay, from 0 to 4, at 4, the value changes to, ha to half, at 4, the value changes to half, and then we go, it remains at half up to let's say 6. At 6, it changes to 1 quarter. Alright? Then, it remains at 1 quarter up to 7. Alright? Up to 7. Then, at 7, it changes to 1 eighth. And it goes on doing this. Alright? When do you think it will complete, it will return, it will be zero. Never. Never. And therefore, if you go up to eight, well, the point eight shall never be reached. All right? But we can say that, now if you repeat this pattern, at eight also, we construct the same type of function, which goes on decreasing in steps like this. And we repeat this on the right hand side as well as on the left hand side. All right, this is a periodic function, but the number of discontinuities is infinite. The discontinuities are finite. Okay, one half, one quarter, and so on, but the number of discontinuities is infinite. And Dirichlet, this is one of the one of the functions which disobeys Dirichlet's third condition. What about the first condition? Does this function obey the first condition? Is it absolutely integrable? Obviously, the area is finite. Okay. Second condition, number of maxima and minima? Yes. Does this function have maxima or minima? No. What is the condition for maxima or minima? The differential coefficient must be at Yes, you are quite right. Differential coefficient must be zero at spot values of the argument, not over a finite interval. This is not a condition of maximum or minima. All right? You must differentiate between highest value, maximum value, lowest value, and minimum value. All right? The, the words maximum and minimum, although in popular parlance, you know, it says uh, between the 17th and 20th, uh, the temperature of Delhi, maximum it rose to so much. Well, the, well, this is not correct. What you record is the highest temperature in a day. The slope is not zero. If you plot, if, the, if it had stayed at that point for a considerable period of time, 
over the observation interval, then you could have seen, but it's not correct to say. Highest and lowest are the uh, correct terminologies. Now, <clears throat> all right, so we, we say Dirichlet conditions are obeyed, X of T obeys Dirichlet conditions. Then does the Fourier series exist? The answer is yes, because there are sufficient conditions, Fourier series exists. The second quest question is, well, Fourier series exists means what? That you can find the A case. You must answer the second question also. If the A case, if none of the A case blow up, then does this A k e to the j k omega 0 t n k equal to minus n to plus n limit n tends to infinity? This question is important. Does this tend to x of t? Well, we, we commented in the earlier condition, that is the energy condition, that it is not necessarily true. That is, the values of x of t and this summation are not necessarily the same at all values of t. What about this case? Did this be sure that yes, indeed it is true? Not only a case exists, but this summation is the same as x of t at all values of t, except, well, let's write it down carefully. x t is identical to the summation a k e to the j k omega 0 t at all t except at the points of discontinuity. These are the exceptions. At the points of discontinuity, the values are not identical. Well, uh, isn't it a little mysterious to state it in this form? Because at a point of discontinuity, what is the value of the function? It's not defined. It's not defined. And therefore, what do you mean by uh, it does not coincide with the, with the value at the point of discontinuity? So you must define a value. And recently defined that at the point of discontinuity, he showed that if a periodic function obeys the display conditions, then at the point of discontinuity, discontinuity, the summation, well, the summation cannot be discontinuous. Are you, are you agreeing with me? Summation is a summation of continuous functions. How can a sum of continuous functions give rise to a discontinuous function? So therefore, at the point of discontinuity, there is no question of convergence of the summation to a particular value of x of t. There is no question. So you must answer this, this query with a very concrete statement. And the concrete statement that the Richler made and proved beyond doubt that at the point of discontinuity, the summation converges to the average value. If t0 is the point of discontinuity, then it converges to x of t0 minus plus x of t0 plus divided by 2. Alright? In other words, <coughs> in other words, if we go back to this uh, square wave question. Okay? Let's say this is 1, this is t1 minus t1, this is t0 by 2 minus t0 by 2. And this is 0. Alright? It means that if you take a, a finite number of uh, Fourier series terms, that is, if you truncate the Fourier series, then all that will happen is, irrespective of how many terms you take, that is, in the summation a k e to the j k omega 0 t, k equals minus n to plus n, irrespective of n. Now, notice the beauty of Fourier series. And this is another reason why Lord Kelvin said it is a piece of mathematical poem. If the speaking of capital N, it doesn't matter how many terms you take, the series always converges to the middle point, that is at half. All right? This series, irrespective of capital N, it always converges to this point. All right? Otherwise, at other points, well, it might show an overshoot and undershoot like this, and so on. Okay. The next thing that, uh, <coughs> the next uh, interesting point about Fourier series 
was uh, discovered by an American uh, physicist by the name Michelson, Albert Michelson uh, of Michelson's interferometer fame. You have heard about Michelson's interferometer? Yes. Oh. Michelson found, where have you heard this interferometer? In modern physics. Michelson Morley experiment. Okay. Michelson, in his uh, interferometric analysis, Michelson was concerned with spectrum. He found that by using Fourier series, well, by using a certain number of terms, he found that yes, indeed a square wave could be approximated. But he found a very interesting phenomenon. He found that irrespective of the number of terms that he used to approximate a square wave by a Fourier series, the overshoot and the undershoot for sufficiently large values of n remain constant. That is, beyond a certain number, it could be 31, for example, beyond a certain number, from 31 to 79, let's say, the overshoot or understood did not change substantially. I have a figure here which I'll show you. This is the ideal weight. Let's use this. This is what we are trying to approximate, okay, minus T1 to T1. I have not shown minus T0 to T0. And this is a single term approximation. You see, A0 plus A1 cosine omega t. That is, A1 and A minus 1 e to the g omega 0 t e to the minus g omega 0 t. So only one cosine. That's why you see a maximum here. And you see that it does converge to the middle of this point, to the middle of this square wave, all right? And the overshoot is this much, the undershoot is this much, somewhere here. This contains two terms, n equal to 1. Uh, this contains three terms, a0, a1, and... No, <laughs> this contains two terms. I have to give you the development. This exercise, with respect to a particular example, in which the second harmonic, fourth harmonic, sixth harmonic, and so on, they are all zero, identically. I'll come back to this later. But uh, let me explain this figure. And three terms, that is, he used two, the first harmonic and the, not, there is no first harmonic. What is the first harmonic? It's the fundamental. The fundamental and the third harmonic. And he found out that it is like this. So this is the overshoot. It does converge to the middle point and so on. Then he used up to seventh harmonic. Only odd harmonics are taken. Up to seventh harmonic, he measured this, this overshoot and this undershoot. And you see that up to 19th harmonic, well, the overshoot and undershoot does not appreciably change. And this is the 79th. He took terms up to 79. Even then, uh, there is an overshoot of... You see, what happens is the number of ripples, number of ripples goes on changing because he's taking more and more harmonics, all right? And therefore, it does go on rippling uh, at a faster rate. But, surprisingly, he found that the overshoot and undershoot does not appreciate the change. And uh, this phenomenon puzzled him terribly. He wrote to a few mathematicians, of whom the, the then American mathematical physicists, rather, and a gentleman by the name Gibbs analyzed this over a considerable period of time. One complete year he spent on this and came out with an explanation of this phenomena, which also shows limitations of the Fourier series. But this we shall tackle next time. Thank you.